I sent an email to my colleagues here at Catalyst this week um, telling them that I have two problems related to WhatsApp. One is that I don't have many talks lined up. Basically none. Um, so that's problem one. Problem two is that the quality of the talks that we've had recently has been too high. So, so what happens is people come along, they watch these amazing speakers, like we've got one lined up any minute, um, and they think, oh, God, I can't perform at that level, so I'm not going to volunteer. So I, I pleaded with my workmates to help me bring the average level of quality down. Um, and, and I've got a lead on someone who's promised to do that. Um, <laughs> so what um, I had been thinking that we might do in the future is have sort of an open, night, open mic session. So we might have a speaker and then an open mic bit after where people who hadn't prepared anything but had something they wanted to talk about could stand up and, and be forgiven for not being, you know, super slick and, and all of that. I wasn't envisaging that we'd be trying that out tonight, but apparently we are. Uh, I have had some thoughts about what I could talk about in that open mic session. Um, and, and once again, thinking back to bringing down that average quality. So I'm going to work on that. Um, the, the idea, the, the perfect talk um, would be uh, describe the problem you're trying to solve, talk about some things you tried that didn't work or whatever, and then um, what the solution was. You might not have all those bits. Um, and, and you know, if, if you did and you could make a talk with graphics and, and, and animation effects, then awesome. Um, but if you had some of those bits um, and you could describe the problem, there might be someone here who can help you solve it. So that's the, the, sort, the point uh, of the open mic session. Right, so, as I said, um, below average talk. Who here travels on public transport regularly? Yeah, 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 quite a few of those. And of those people, how many of you have a notes app on your mobile device? You could all get one, for goodness sake. <laughs> so, I... Um, have a notes app on my phone that um, I put ideas in for talks sometimes, and I haven't done that much recently, but I put so this in here. So normally what would happen is that would get turned into slides and some sort of um, narrative would be thought about in advance, but that's not happening. Um, so we're going live this talk is called, actually I don't need that, um, I'll leave it there. Um, this talk is called Grip and Friends. So my thinking was that these days um, quite a few people are finding themselves coming in contact with, with um, Linuxy command lines, whether it be Linux itself or one of the BSDs or um, Windows services for Linux. Um, and they're doing things on the command line, and maybe some of them didn't grow up at Bell Labs in the 1970s, um, and therefore some of these things don't necessarily um, seem obvious to them. So I wanted to talk about one command in particular, grep. Um, so um, where I wanted to start... with an image yeah exactly right so here is a crossword um, and I'm sure most of you have already worked out what that word highlighted in yellow is but if we wanted to do that using the computer how would we solve 
this crossword. Um, and uh, what I would do is um, put that in the background. I would use um, a command like, for example, less. And I would go to this file which contains all the English words. That it starts with all these proper nouns that have a capital letter at the beginning. Um, no. How do you get to 60% and less? 60%. Right, cool. Okay, there we go. So lots of lots of words. So grep is a tool for taking a stream of lines of text and giving you the ones that match the pattern. So if I said grep and a and that file name, uh, if you didn't know, by the way, I hit alt dot then, which gave me alt dot gives you the last thing from the previous command. Um, so now it's given me all the words from that file that have an A in them somewhere. So my command, which is down the bottom here, um, with grep A and a file name. So it finds every line in that file that has an A. So the magic character for matching one of anything is dot. So if I do A dot A, then that will find me every word that has an A, some other character, and an A. The some other character could actually be an A, but there probably aren't any words in there with three A's in a row. So, another magic character um, is the carrot, uh, the up or carré, the upwards pointing arrow accent thingy. So if I do carré dot a, that's something A, that means the word starts with something A, then something A, then something Y, then something T. And the answer will be... Uh, and if, in fact, I put um, a dollar on the end, that means that T is the last thing on... It did work though. So um, it would generally be better practice when you're doing something like that to put single quotes around it. And then I get the same result. But if I if I put dollar something, that wouldn't have made sense anyway, because there wouldn't be anything after the end of the line. Anyway, so that's grip. If I uh, type command man grip. So that gives me the m manual page for grip. Um, and there's a whole lot of stuff in there that I'll actually make it a bit smaller. Okay. So I run that command again and redirect it into a file. So the greater than symbol and then a file name will take what would have gone to the screen and puts it in a file. We'll ignore those warnings for now. That's What's happened there is uh, the man command is trying to format the lines to fit in the width of window that I selected um, and it couldn't break some of the lines so it warned me about it. So now I have a file with... Um, Alt dot with that man page in it, um, which is pretty much exactly what I got when I did this. Can anyone see any difference between this? Yeah, yes, cool. We'll come back to that. So, um, we'll look at another image. A 
some cool hot cold. So, back when these commands um, were being first created, this is what terminals looked like on computers. Uh, it's called a teletype, um, and it's a combination of a printer and a keyboard, and in this case, a paper tape reader. I think that's just, it might be a writer as well, but it's definitely a reader. Um, so, Unlike this sort of output, when you um, type a command and the results come out, they print on physical paper, and then the paper advances, um, and hence um, in the um, ASCII character set, there's a, a character called line feed that moves the page up one line. Um, and you type a command, and you'd hit enter, and some number of lines of output might come out. Um, and they're printed. They're, they're physically out there. They're gone. Um, one of the features of the software that formats these pages is that in the source code for the man page, um, there's um, some markup that says this should be in bold. What actually happens is the character G is sent to the printer, followed by a backspace, followed by another G, and then a backspace and another G. I think it typically did it eight times. And it prints, moves the print head over, prints it, comes back and does it again, over and over, and, and so it came out bold on the paper. That's physically how it worked. And so this, this terminal window is um, a GNOME terminal that's pretending to be an X terminal that's pretending to be a VT100 physical dumb terminal. Um, and you can get in the mode with some of these commands where you get that actual output coming out if, you, if your terminal variable is not set up properly. Um, and here's a tip for you. There's a command. C-O-L, I don't know what it stands for, col, and col minus B strips out the backspaces and leaves you with just the one copy of each character. Um, so, uh, But if I do man and redirect it to a file, it detects that its standard output is not connected to a terminal, so it doesn't do the bold coding stuff and you just get the plain text which is why it looked different. So anyway, this is what terminals used to look like. Now, you kids these days, when you want to edit a file, you probably fire up, I don't know, Microsoft Visual Code, who knows, and you'll be reaching for a device like this and, and doing things like clicking on the line or the, the, the word that you want to change and, and typing over it. That was not a possibility uh, in the days uh, of devices like these. Um, and, I mean, some of you may have experienced the joys of working with an a, um, editor like VI. And that was a revolution in its day because it allowed you to move around, like up and down in the file. With, I mean, originally they didn't have cursor keys, but... They got there in the end. Um, but in these days, you couldn't do that. So if you had a text file like this one I created minutes ago and you wanted to edit it, um, you would use a program like ED. And this would work on the teletype thing. Um, and then I could say man, uh, not man, grip. Yes. Yeah, it does. It does. It's built in there. So um, I'm using ED here. EX is kind of the, the built-in one from VI. So this is me editing the file. It didn't tell me much. It's given me this number, which is probably the number of characters in the file. I guess we could tell if I quit out 
uh, Alice uh, right. um, yeah it's the number of characters uh, which we can see here that's the file size um, so the reason it doesn't tell you much I mean normally you go into an editor and, and you can see your file but if it did that this thing would be printing out a big chunk of your file that Presumably, you had a pretty good idea of what was in that file, or you wouldn't have been trying to edit it. Um, so it would be a waste of paper. So you might come along here, and uh, you start your editor, and it tells you the bare minimum because it doesn't want to waste your paper or your time. Um, you, you may have heard of, of um, back in the dial-up modem days, they sort of maxed out at around 56 kilobits. Um, when I started with dumb terminals, people were mostly using 9.6 kilobits. This used to do 75 bits, not kilobits. 75 bits per second was where these typically operated. So the, the signals coming across the wire were roughly the same speed as print head moving and that was not a coincidence because this was a mechanical device um, it had some electrical components but I'm not sure that it had electronic as such certainly not semiconductor anyway um, so I'm in my editor um, and I want to um, edit a line um, now what I could do is I might know that I wanted to edit line 7. So I could type 7 and hit enter, and it's printed out line 7 for me. I could have done, let's say, 1 to 1,25p. So I've given a range of lines, 1,25, and then the command p for print, and it's printed out those lines. And as a, as a shortcut, if I hit enter, moves my context to the next line uh, and prints that line out. So I could do this, waste lots of paper and get to the thing I wanted. Um, and maybe I get to a line that looks like this. Um, minus P, capital P, that turns on Perl regular expressions. Um, I didn't mention earlier, but that um, carrot, the dot, the dollar, that's all a language, a pattern matching language called regular expressions. So we can use a different flavor of regular expression by giving this option minus capital P or spelling it out in long form minus minus Perl dash regex. Now let's say hypothetically, and I know you won't believe this, but hypothetically, let's say I was offended by the word Perl. So this, I, this is my context on this line, whatever it is, I could type the command substitute, so S for substitute, slash Perl, and then let's change it to Python. <laughs> and it is true that Python records are nearly as good as Perl. Um, yeah, I could put G on the end. Um, if I don't put G on the end, it will only change the first one it finds on the line. Uh, there's only one, so it doesn't make any difference in this case. Um, so now, um, I don't actually know what line I'm on. And if I hit enter, it's going to show me the next line. Um, how do you show the current line? I don't know. A minus one. What does that do? And then enter. There we go. Right. So it's changed that line. This is how you used to have to edit in the old days. Um, now, I manually found that line that said Perl, and then I did the command to change it. What I could have done. Ed, oh, no, it's. Um, what I could have done. Is this down because it's not holding it here okay okay right I'll do that it's like 
a warm embrace. Um, so I could type uh, g slash pearl slash. That means go to, I think g stands for global, um, find every line that matches this pattern and then run the substitute uh, slash pearl slash python slash g. And once again, it doesn't tell us anything because it doesn't want to waste our paper, but that means it worked. If it if it hadn't worked, if I'd done something wrong, it would have given me an error message. Now, if you've ever written code that generates error messages, you know it can be really hard. Well, it wasn't hard for these guys. The error message is a question mark. It doesn't matter what the error is, you get a question mark. Um, so, for example, I've, I've changed all those lines. Um, so I've edited the file. So if I did Q to quit, what it should say is, do you want to save? What it says is, question mark. <laughs> um, so, um, now, how do we know that it actually worked? If I go back to that uh, previous line command and say, and <laughs> go back to, it's not like I can hit the up arrow key, it's not going to accept that. Um, so if I say, find me every line that contains pearl, and just print it, there are none. And if I say, find every line that contains Python, and just print that, these are the ones that it changed from Perl to Python. Now, <laughs> this line here, here, you can see the limitations of the technology here. Okay, so this command that I typed here and a slightly different one here, I did G to globally apply this pattern match and then print. So G, regular expression, P. G R E P. And that's why grep is called grep. And, and in answer to the unasked question, well, how do you get out? You might reach for Q exclamation point, but question mark. Uh, in fact, it's shift Q, obviously. Um, uh, right, so I said, Jeep has gone on quite a bit. Um, I said I was going to talk about grep and friends. I think I won't, because um, that would just go on for too long. So I'll come back to that another day. Um, am I right in hoping that there was someone in the room who was interested in, in learning a bit more about the command line? Oh, yay, phew. Um, so we could do more of that sometime, and it doesn't have to be me. <laughs> desperately keen for other people to do talks. Um, so I will um, stop here and, and threaten to revisit um, things related to grep at a future time. Yes, David offered to talk about a Wikipedia thing. Did anyone else want to leap in after him? Yes. Okay. Well, come up here and do that, and then we'll hand over to David. Okay, um, this is something that I wasn't aware of. I suspect I'm going to show it, and then everyone is going to say, I've known about that forever. Where have you been? So, um, obviously, man is incredibly useful. We just had a look at the man page for grip. We can look at the man page for other things. Hey, what does that find thing do? And we can look through that. But normally, these um, files are very large, and the thing that you're really interested in is how is that command used normally? How do I use it all the time? Um, sometimes if you go to the bottom, they will have examples in there, which not this case. Um, but yeah, you can, this is the kind of thing often what you want. Um, so there's a project online called TLDR. 
too long didn't read and it's alright if I open up a browser. There we are. Cool. And it's a community Cool, that looks right. Um, it's community contributed uh, pages. I think it's Um, so, uh, what you can do is type in TLDR, the command that you want to know more about, and they will give you a section of, uh, yeah, examples that you can go and look at, which is uh, normally when I go into a man page, what I'm actually after. Um, these are community contributed, so you can actually go and say, there's that thing I use all the time. I think everyone else should use it. Let's add it to the um, command. So they will improve over time. Um, I believe it is done in Git as well. So you can just uh, write Markdown in Git or some similar thing, and they will wind up. So you can do pull requests. It's not um, a new system to learn to have to add things for. Um, yeah, TLDR. <laughs> and your name is? Thank you, Rob. Right, well, in the interest of lowering the quality, I thought I would talk a bit about a couple of Wikipedia things that you may not know about. So everyone probably knows about Wikipedia. It shows up in your search results. And, um, and when that comes up... Um, yeah, everyone's familiar with Wikipedia and you, sometimes you take articles with a grain of salt and obviously New Zealand, is, there's a lot of gaps in New Zealand Wikipedia about New Zealand topics and there's a dedicated group of editors around New Zealand that work on Wikipedia. So, um, But I thought I'd mention a couple of projects that you may or may not be aware. So there's lots of images in um, Wikipedia and they tend to be put in a sub-project of Wikipedia called um, the Commons. So has, ever, has people heard of the Commons? I'm sure some people have, yeah. So if you're looking for nice pictures, or hopefully I get the website right. Um, yeah, there's millions of pictures and other media, so like videos and things like that. And the pictures of the day are always useful. So if prose isn't your thing and you don't like writing, um, but you're good with a camera or you're going around New Zealand because you can't go overseas um, and you take lots of photos on your phone, then then you can upload your photos to Commons and, and license them with a Creative Commons license or open data license. I won't show you a demo, and um, but it's really, there's a little wizard down the left-hand side here somewhere, um, upload upload a file and it just guides you through uploading that, choosing a license and and and, and doing that. So I would encourage you to do that um, if you if you like photos and um, want to make your photos available. Um, so as an example of how bad Wellington some some coverage of Wellington is, um, has anyone anyone been to Catherine Mansfield um, Memorial Park? Does anyone know where that is or that it exists? Yeah, so it's in Thorndon and it's a nice little park. And you would think with, and I can't spell, you would think with it, Catherine Mansfield being a relatively well-known author, um, that there, there, there were, might be at least one or two photos of Catherine Mansfield par um, Memorial Park, but there was none. So this was in April. And so I took some photos and uploaded them, such as they are. So now you can find some photos of Catherine Mansfield Park if you want to see what it looks like. Um, it's near the American Embassy. So anyone can upload photos. And, um, and if you're looking for photos to use in your presentations or um, things, there's some really amazing photos on here. And particularly all the previous pictures of the day, there's some really awesome photos from around the world. Um, 
And the last thing I really wanted to mention was my favorite Wikipedia. So there's lots of projects in Wikipedia. So my favorite one is um, um, Wikidata. So has anyone heard of Wikidata? Okay, so I'll try and explain it as simply as I can. Um, so if you go to a typical Wikipedia page, and I'll, who can I search for? Um, so you've got the nice little Wikipedia thing in there. And yeah, there's a lot of information. This is a really good article <laughs> about somebody. Some articles are not quite so good. Um, but if you look at the page, there's a lot of information there that is just text and it's not it's structured, but you wouldn't know that. So you've got his date of birth and when he died and his spouse and things like that. So what tends to happen, all this, there's lots of other language Wikipedians, Wikipedias, and so they might have that same information there, but there might be an error. So you find an error and someone updates their page, but then if you know the other page exists, you've got to update it all. So what Wikipedia is trying to do is some of the structured data that's used in multiple places, um, they're turning it into structured data that can be used anywhere else. Um, so on every Wikipedia page, there's this little thing called Wikidata item. And if you're familiar with databases, it, it's really a little database of structured data about something. So it's it's saying here that this is Edmund Hillary and he was a New Zealand mountaineer. And then there's a whole lot of statements about that thing. In this case, a human. You know, here's some images of him. He's a human. Um, he's a male. <laughs> you know, where, you know, um, where he, citizenship, lots of things, where he died, was born and where he died. And if you know Wikipedia a little bit, there's lots of references to things. So, so something that backs up your statement. And so, you know, there's a whole lot of things here that people have referenced to say, this is where I got this information from, rather than just making it up. Yeah. So you say, well, that's cool, sort of, maybe. <laughs> um, what can I do with that? So what's happening progressively, you know, you've got all of, uh, I haven't got his page anymore. Um, you've you've got um, all of this data over here. Now that can be generated, they call it a template, but you can basically say, get all this information that's in this block here from, from Wikidata. And then when someone updates that, then it's automatically going to be reflected in that Wikipedia page. And in the the British English version, no, it's probably not one, um, in the French version, um, it'll grab that data from there as well. And the other bit is that it's not just English-centric. So you can show lots of different languages. So I can't show it because I'm not logged in. But, um, you know, people obviously, well, his name is Edmund Hillary, but <laughs> so the description in other languages. So people who are key, you know, have no other languages can put make these statements here and then when they're used on other things, um, other language Wikipedians, then, then what am I trying to say? Um, <laughs> then they're in that language there. So, yeah, so I like Wikidata because it's structured data and you can put in statements and back them up. Um, and I guess the other thing you can do with this is there's lots of queries. So. I'm not really an open data person, but there's lots of knowledge bases and things you can query. And so Wikidata lets you do that. Um, it has a query language, which is called Sparkle, S-P-A-R-Q-L. So has anyone heard of that? Um, it's basically lets you query all of these statements. And I'm just trying to, there's something on the page here that says, where's the query? Um, they have lots of example queries. So you can query all the stuff that's in, in Wikidata to get lists of buildings or famous people or people who were born between these dates. Um, there's, 
the the Wikidata bit is an extension to Wikimedia, so it's called Wikibase. I think is what it's called. So you can create your own structured database of things and the same same sort of tools that are here. So if you have some really structured data that you know you don't want to put into a free form page and you don't want to create a MySQL database and or Postgres and <laughs> do things, um, you know you can create that data model. So all of these things like Sir Edmund Hillary, um, you know that a lot of people spend time trying to figure out what are the models and properties that reflect different things, buildings to books to people to events or anything under the sun. So, um, yeah, so you can build your own if you want to and you can get all the Wikidata data but um, as well. But I think it's quite large now. There's 93, um, what's that, 93 million. Uh, in Wikidata land we call... This number here is called a QID. Um, I think I know what it means, but I, but it's basic. Everything's got a unique ID, um, and um, so yeah, there's 93 millions of those. Unfortunately, half of those are there's a big interest to try and get journal articles and other things. So about half of them are journal um, papers, you know, um, from various things. But there's a lot of data in there. Um, cool. And I realise uh, I've just there is some queries around the place, but I've probably got on enough. Um, the un the only final thing I was going to say, there's a Wikipedia meetup in Wellington, and there's also um, there's other group. There's an online one, and um, we'll see how good Google is. Um, but I think you should just be able to search for if I can spell Wik. Wellington Meetup. Oh, yes. <laughs> and we m meet in the National Library um, uh, once a month. So if anyone's interested in some of these Wikipedia, not just Wikipedia, but the Commons or, or the Wikidata thing, then everyone's more than welcome to come along. And the only other thing I'd say, if you're more into learning things through physical conferences, in-person conferences. There's one coming up in Auckland, when we're not in Auckland, but there's one in Auckland in July. Um, it's the second Wikimedia con in, Wellington, in New Zealand. And then in October, November, there's a link here somewhere. Um, there's going to be one in, in Wellington as well over a couple of days up at Victoria University. Here we are, Wiki, Wikicon Aotearoa. And... Uh, there should be a date there, end of November. So if you're interested in Wikidata, Wikipedia things, you're more than welcome to come along.